But okay, so yes, like I said, we're finally getting to go over the Famitsu article translation. Uh, Mr. Two Love Trouble was kind enough to translate all of this uh, pretty much by hand, uh, live on his stream. The VOD for that uh, he has up on his YouTube, I believe, already. But I always like to make a transcription of it. That's basically what this is. We're going to cover both Mr. Two and Nasu and Takeuchi's interviews with this. And I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of my thoughts on it and what they were kind of meaning as well. But this way, there is a transcription of what was actually said so that we kind of have, you know, something to go off of and look back towards. Um, it is an interesting article. I'm not going to spoil you guys on it. There are some things that are troublesome in here. There are some things that are uh, uplifting a little bit and, and confidence giving. But uh, definitely, definitely depends on your take on the game. So... Let's start out here with, again, Mr. Two, as he is our sort of uh, lead dev in charge of part two of the game that is, uh, again, Lost Belt and, uh, you know, even Ordeal Call at this point, as it's sort of somewhat tied in with Lost Belt. So, uh, again, these are sort of like summarizations of what was happening. This isn't like a quick bullet points thing. This is a long laundry list of things that were said. So they start out by saying that uh, basically the, the interviewer asked him about the year and he said this is the hardest year that they have experienced, that there were just new challenges and everything that they were doing. And they start talking actually a lot about LB7's map. This is going to be a spoiler-free like thing as much as possible, but there is at least a couple of gameplay elements I included in here. So don't worry about that, but you're not going to get spoiled on the actual story. Um... But they did talk about how LB7's map is approached differently than other story maps. It was difficult to implement properly. And this is because it's a 3D map. For those of you guys that have been on my stream and you've seen it, you know exactly what it's talking about. But for anyone that hasn't seen it, just understand it is not your typical map. You will definitely experience that when you get to 7. Uh, it is an interesting thing. And apparently it was a huge problem for them to actually implement. It was their first time working with a 3D map in the game. Some of the mapping team had prior experience with 3D assets that did help them because otherwise they would have had nothing really to go off of. And so apparently that smoothed out the process quite a bit. And they actually said that they learned quite a lot from it. So I, I think it's because it's a little bit more dynamic of a 3D asset. It's not just a one-to-one -one thing. And you can actually see this again uh, for any of you guys that have seen, say, Ordeal Call with the globe there. That one's also another like 3D asset, so... Uh, LB7's live stream was apparently delayed three hours due to a data error that had to be fixed before implementation. This is a really interesting thing. We got a little bit of behind the scenes as to what was going on with the whole LB7 uh, stream delay and or part delay there. So they basically said that the Q&A team found it right before the release of the live stream. They almost canceled the update after the live stream still due to it. Uh, luckily, the call that it was fixed came in right before. So basically, they delayed the live stream by three hours. Then they just went ahead and did the live stream. But then they were still going to cancel the update because it still hadn't been fixed. It was apparently a like the way they worded it, it was like a master data error. I don't think that means you and I, the master. I think it means like an, a data error affecting like pretty much the entire game. They had a huge issue with it. So certainly not an easy thing for them at that point that they discovered it right beforehand. Um, yeah, luckily the call was fixed that it came in right before. Uh, the interviewer asked if it was due to particularly to uh, the particularly taxing fights in LB7. There is one that he mentioned specifically. I'm not going to mention it, but Mr. Two just said it was an allocation error. So we have no idea what that really means. He, he didn't elaborate on it. Uh, apparently, it took them two two weeks still to fully smooth out the update and implement everything. Uh, for those of you guys that were unaware, two weeks later, they did a patch after like the first part's release. And there were some extra things in that that were apparently supposed to be in the original patch. Uh, I won't talk about that, but it's it's kind of interesting to say the least that apparently that was intended originally for launch and they didn't get it out right away. Uh, he regrets how rocky LB7's release was. I think that's that should come as a surprise to no one. Like, we we all kind of witnessed everything that went on with that release, and it was very poorly handled, to say the least. I think the devs tried their best, but at the end of the day, like, that's definitely going to hurt you when people are really waiting on it. They've been hyped up for it for an entire year, 
and then it gets delayed and then it's buggy and then it's a mess and yeah that that's not going to make people very happy so uh lb7 uh, needed to be shown in 3D to fully realize the story. Again, this is just them talking about the map still and why they kind of had to, to do it that way. Basically, uh, they needed to display the map in the way that they did for you to really feel like you're there, for you to really understand how it was working. Otherwise, you would just have words on a screen. You wouldn't quite understand it. It wouldn't make as much sense to you. Um, the interviewer moves on to class score now. So Mr. Two says that class score was one of their biggest efforts thus far. Uh, it's meant to be a representation for the final battles that will begin when the story comes to its conclusion. So uh, this is actually quite interesting that I'm not going to say that either Mr. Two or Nasu in this interview are very doom and gloomy, but they do mention the conclusion several times, the conclusion of the story, the end of the story. Um, I think at this point, we pretty much know that the story is going to keep going on. Uh, for those of you guys that didn't see also, and I'm not going to actually go over the uh, the uh, polls because I've seen a lot of that already done on Twitter and everything. But uh, one of the polls actually was people like like them polling people. Would you like the game to end? Do you want it to keep going? You know, that sort of stuff. And the vast majority of people said they still want it to keep going. So Nasu has said in prior years that they would ask the community on that issue when they got close to the end. And they would go with the community's decision. So the community seemingly has decided, no, we want the game to keep going. And as a result, I don't think you're gonna uh, see this end anytime soon. Uh, I, I don't really quite understand the people that want the game to end other than maybe they want like the end to that temptation to roll, but I won't get into that too much. Still just an interesting uh, thing that they did pull that finally. Um. And so again, they, they mentioned that it's for uh, sort of the final battles. So class score is meant to help you out with these things. Uh, they needed to allow the master themselves to be upgraded, indicating that the class score is a master upgrade more than a servant one. So chat, when you're upgrading class score, you're not technically upgrading your servants. You're upgrading your master's capability to command your servants. That's what it really is. That's an interesting little thing that they put in there that I didn't quite realize. Um, and that's honestly kind of cool. I like that, that it's like, hey, this is, this is basically you, the protagonist, getting an upgrade. Uh, they discussed this with Type Moon and they were able to realize it because they basically approached Type Moon and said like, hey, you know, we, we want to allow for an upgrade to the master and Type Moon gave the okay for that. Uh, it's meant to alleviate the pain of otherwise impossible fights. This one, don't take this one too seriously, chat. Remember, dev speak is what it is. And I, I did put in otherwise because they said the pain of impossible fights. And I'm just like, I mean, it's clearly not impossible otherwise. And, and I, I think this bears worth mentioning too, that there is just simply no way they can balance the game around class score, at least not for a long time, right? Because like, I'll give you an example of this. Let's say you're fighting a Lancer. Well, guys, I did my Lancer class score. So, you know, I would be fucked there because my Lancer isn't necessarily going to be effective against another Lancer. But if someone did their Saber class score, oh, then they would be able to do the fight very easily. So that's where it's like, you know, I'm not really sure that they can actually balance around you having unlocked and, and gone deep into the class score unless there's some way that they can funnel you down one of them. And you'll even see from what Mr. Two says from here that that doesn't appear to be the way they're thinking. So I wouldn't worry about it. I, I think it's just that class score is going to make it easier on you. Um, interviewer asked when they started preparing class score. Mr. Two says that it was around the same time LB7 was being implemented. So the beginning of 2022. That is to say they started working on LB7 chat basically like December of 2021 slash January of 2022. That's really interesting that they were working on it a year out. That definitely makes sense then as to why they started doing the whole Road to Seven campaign and hyping it up for a year. But that's also crazy to me because that either implies that they're either overlapping with teams, which is a good thing if they are, and that 6.5 was still getting worked on, or that 6.5 was already done prior to that point. So really, really intriguing to hear and, and that's one of those things that I would say behind the scenes, I'm always curious to hear how their scheduling is going. Because I think to us, 
it always looks like, you know, everything's worse than it seems behind the scenes and that they're flying by the seat of their pants and they're barely able to get stuff out. And they do kind of allege that uh, later on in this interview as well. Um, it took them three months to really flesh out the concept for Class Score, and they had different prototypes that uh, they ultimately ended up not going with, which is very peculiar. They thought about how long it would take for the player to finish the system. I want you guys to really pay attention to this line. The devs thought about how long it would take you to finish Class Core. The reason that's important is that tells you that they're designing the system to take a long time on purpose. That's why they made the storm pods. Uh, sorry, that shouldn't be and limited. That's why they made the storm pods limited. There you go. Uh, however, they were made after everything with class score uh, was complete. So basically they finished the entire class score system, then made storm pods, right? Because they made the system, then they thought about how long it would take someone to complete the system. Then they put the artificial barrier to stop you from completing it too fast. Because they, they realized they messed up. Interviewer asked for an estimate as to how long it will take players to finish. Mr. Two dodged this question, and I, I gotta give him shit for this. He knows that answer, he purposefully didn't say. He just basically said, well, you know, because of, because of our implementation of storm pods, we don't know how long it will take you to finish now. And I'm like, that's bullshit. You, you know. I guarantee you they calculated that out and they implemented it to such a degree that they, they know how long it's going to take you. Uh, and he even says that you won't be able to complete it in days or even months. So that right there contradicts his own statement that he doesn't know. He knows it's going to take you longer than a year to complete the system, which tells you he knows how long it it's going to take in general. So, um, he recommends picking and focusing on a class. So there you go, chat. Just like I was saying, they, they cannot necessarily balance it around like the fight that you've chosen unless the game were to know that you had picked a class score and then g give you a fight based off the class score you'd pick. That would be an interesting one. But otherwise, they couldn't really, you know, balance you know, an individual fight around it that's one particular class because you might not have leveled up whatever the counter to that class is. Um, says players are always breaking their expectations for how fast they clear systems. So, chat, allow me to translate dev speak for you. Mr. Two is saying y'all completed your append requirements way too damn fast and they needed a new system to force you to have to keep playing the game. Really all it is. Right up what it is. And that is why I do think that the, there's no mention of coins in here, why they're probably not going to end up fixing it. Uh, they already view the append system as over and done with in their eyes. And they're just going to keep milking those coins for extra profits for themselves. So that's supposition on my part. But that's, that's how I read this, uh, basically, that... Kind of reading between the lines, Mr. Two is kind of being like, yeah, you guys complete stuff too fast. You guys are too degen. You just pop apples or quartz and get it done. They wanted storm pods to be a reward, which is why these nodes are better. This is true. Uh, I do actually believe this, that they probably sat down and said, hey, look, uh, if you're going to have storm pods, if they're going to, you know, be gating, we're going to at least make the node worth your while so that you still want to do them. We're going to make it better than other nodes since you have only a limited amount of them to do. That's why they give such good bond and such good rewards, potentially. Um, if they didn't limit it, it would have caused a gap between veteran players who had access and newer players who didn't. Chat, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to call bullshit on this. Uh, that's still the case. In fact, because it is limited, a newer player will not be able to ever catch up. The older player will always have an advantage until people start actually finishing. So, yeah, there is just going to be a permanent gap from whenever one player started compared to whenever another player started. Unless the person just doesn't log in, doesn't do it. Yeah, so like, I'm sorry, that one doesn't fly in my book. That, that's a bullshit excuse. Um, they were concerned about burnout for veterans as well if it wasn't unchecked. Okay. <laughs> bullshit. Because you already saw they, they basically are really concerned with uh, how long it takes players to finish the system. 
So it's straight up, they put a barrier to entry. They, they gated you so that you couldn't complete it too fast. Not like, oh, well, you'll burn out if you, if you do it too much. They, they straight up knew that people would just degen pop courts, which, you know, to one degree, that is maybe, you know, noble of them. They didn't allow people to irresponsibly spend money on their game. To another degree, that might just be the dumbest decision they've ever made because I'm really surprised that they wouldn't allow people to spend money on them. It's for our well-being, yes. Okay, so, I mean, again. Um, yeah, they were concerned for burnout of veterans here. Uh, the interviewer asked why they didn't just use the old BP structure for storm pots. This is an interesting point, but I don't like it. And screw the interviewer for bringing up BP. Let it die. Uh, it's an interesting concept that, like, yeah, why did you give us a storm pod type mechanic when you could have just used an already existing system that had been retired? Um, I think that at the end of the day, though, uh, the issue with BP is that, like, well, it, it regenerates hourly. So people would have been, like, going crazy. They would have had to really revamp the BP system. Uh, Mr. Two says, due to the storm pods having a time gate, uh, forcing it to be used, otherwise the player will just make more blue apples. And see, here you go. This is, this is where he starts, like, contradicting himself. He's come up with multiple reasons for the same thing. And the blue apples are kind of his actual true reason. Um, he said a whole bunch of dev speak lines. Blue apples are the real reason, chat. He does not want you sitting there constantly making blue apples. Thus, storm pods are both limited in how fast you can obtain them, but also limited as to how many you can hold. I'm going to be real with you, and you're not going to like me for saying this. The devs fucked up when they made blue apples uncapped. They absolutely should have made it like Genshin's resin system, where, again, it had a finite cap and could not be held too much, right? Like, you want to hold, like, three days worth? Sure, go for it. You know, find some time until you can play again. But they should have never let us generate as many blue apples as we do. Because that is exactly why people are hoarding them for lottos. It is exactly why people are probably no longer popping quartz in the game. So they're trying to combat that. I think they realize that not only is that happening, but that people are just legitimately logging in, making blue apples, and logging back out. They 100% know that the player base is now, like, checked out mentally. So... That's why they, they put this in. And we called that, you know, from pretty much the second the storm pods came out. That's, that's not a surprise to us. But it is nice to kind of hear him confirm that. Uh, it says that players will just keep making blue apples if they have a choice. He's right. He's 100% right here. I absolutely agree that if you put the option of make blue apples or just spin down your AP, every player will choose make blue apples because they don't have to do anything for it. But he thinks that it will burden them, implies a lack of farming things they need. So this is my note here. He didn't imply that. I'm saying, I think that's what he's implying. That basically by virtue of the fact that if you all you do is make blue apples, that it, you'll be burdened by that. He's kind of trying to say that, like, yeah, you're not going to actually do your three runs a day at that point. You're not going to actually, you know, uh, farm out some of the materials that you might need, like statues to level up your stuff or uh, ascension materials. Here's the problem with this, because he says there's a lot of emphasis on not wanting to burden the player. Okay. Okay. BP caused the player to have to do twice as much in a day since it didn't consume AP, which is why the storm pods have an AP cost attached to them. Fair. I'm okay with that, right? Like, I understand. Um, then Mr. Two mentions that they're putting in new, the so more or new apples. We're not sure which. They said that there is a, like, the Trubs used the word, it's like a healing uh, option for this. But that essentially, this is going to be in events to help you to have enough AP for both the event and storm pods. Now, if you already caught the problem with this in the past couple sentences, kudos to you, but I'm going to explain it for you. So, for starters, just to go back to that original topic there, like I said, we don't know is this a 
new Apple, a new like ordeal call specific Apple, or is this a like, hey, yeah, uh, you know, we've just added more. We just tweaked the integer on gold apples. There's now more gold apples in the event. It's absolutely possible. But the issue at play here is he talks about burnout for veterans, protecting the players from doing, you know, uh, too little and or too much. And then he basically contradicts himself by saying, but you know what? We're not going to like turn the, the storm pods off. They, they do say that in the next line, actually, they will not freeze storm pods during an event. So they're not stopping or delaying storm pods in any way while an event goes on. And the issue with storm pods, as you guys know, is it's 40 AP per run. You have three storm pods a day. So that is functionally 120 of your like, what is it? 220 something AP you gain a day chat. 120 down the tube to only storm pods. That is going to make it exceedingly difficult to, you know, complete an event on that AP which they may be doing on purpose to make you spawn and, and use apples, right? But at the end of the day, that is going to be a huge concern. So it's interesting to see that they, they talk about protecting you and, not, and, and like, hey, we're not going to use BP because if we used BP, you would have to do twice as much in a day since it didn't consume AP. But then down here, they're going, hey, here's an apple so you can still do the event and your storm pods in a day, AKA twice as much in a day. So it's bullshit. <laughs> it's circular logic. It doesn't work. And you just kind of see Mr. Two is kind of spinning here, trying to come up with something that sticks. He's trying to throw out every excuse he can think of. Doesn't quite work, right? This, this is very concerning to me that it seems like they, they understand there's a problem here, but they know they shouldn't have done what they did, but they can't take it back. So they, they're having to take corrective action is basically what it is. Like I said, they, they should have put a cap on our blue apples. That is truly what they should have done. Uh, but they didn't implement the system that way and they can't do it now because people would scream. So that's the issue that they run into there. Uh, the interviewer remarks how different the structure and rewards are for each of the bleached earth nodes. So if you remember, uh, he talks about that up here, that the storm pods are a reward, and that's why the nodes are better. But he basically, down here, the interviewer kind of makes this comment about, like, yeah, the reward for some of the quests are lackluster. And he even laughs at the end of this. Not wrong, in the slightest. The interviewer has 100% got the right of that. Uh, Mr. Two claims that some of the nodes were made were made so you could complete them faster and that the rewards are tailored to that. Huh? <laughs> I, I don't get that, right? Like, honestly, the shell node is actually not that bad. But I think the real benefit that you get is like master experience and bond from doing these. The actual drops are not that good. Um, the interviewer then asks, basically, if we will get more free quests for the Bleached Earth uh, area and if they'll come with Socho too. Mr. Two says that Ordeal Call is a big turning point for us all. Uh, therefore, each campaign of Socho, and a couple times outside that, they'll add more free quests and challenges. So for those of you guys who don't remember, there were a couple of fights that were one-off completion things that were challenges. Uh, but they also were like one and done, you did them and they're gone. So really weird. Um, but it looks like they want to add more of that and they will be adding more free quests on a semi- regular interval so in that regard it does sound like the nodes and the rewards will be getting better but also again i'm going to call back to the original point that he made about the gap and that they didn't want there to be a gap between new players and old players um the better rewards you lock behind the you know very late game story completion area uh yeah the bigger the gap becomes right like it basically becomes like like you know sort of uh uh like kind of better nodes for for the the rich and famous but uh terrible nodes for those who aren't right like it, that's kind of the way it thinks about or that's kind of the way i think about it is like the the new people don't have nearly as efficient ways of grinding stuff the old people have the most efficient ways of grinding stuff and you can't ever make it the reverse but i am surprised that they are kind of going to be doing that so it will be interesting uh 
Again, from there, they said uh, the interviewer asked if the rotating earth can be made easier for this mode. Again, the rotating earth is a 3D asset. It's a little weird to, to turn, but it's not that bad. I like I'm surprised the interviewer even brings this up. Uh, Mr. Two said they'll think about it. From there, he moves on to talking about events. Uh, the Ilya Lotto exhibition challenges were made. See, chat, I told you we were going to talk about exhibition quests. Uh, were made to be able to allow everyone to complete them. I, For those of you guys that didn't do the Ilias uh, EQs, they were actually really nice. Like, they didn't take a whole lot of time. They had a set party. You went in there, they were a little bit of a puzzle, but it was nothing too bad. And so, like, it fulfilled the need to have something other than just mindless grind there, but it definitely didn't feel like it took, like, exorbitant amounts of time, Okay. Mr. Two talks about that they felt the concern of challenges taking up too much time at a lotto. Yeah, this is the part where you can tilt your head back and laugh. Especially those of you who are old enough to remember his comment two years ago. Because I made a note of this. It's hilarious given that they already admitted to this two years ago. They already said that they knew this was an issue and said that they wouldn't be putting challenge quests in lottos again. And then they made Tesla Fest. And they didn't just put challenge quests in a lotto. They made the most challenge quests they've ever put in any event by far. There are 31 challenge quests in Tesla Fest. It will take you days to complete them. Yeah. People complained, and good for them. It took that before the devs finally got it rammed into their ass that, yeah, you don't want to put that many challenge quests in a lotto. I am not anti-challenge quest in the slightest. Just separate them. Just make it like the week before the lotto. Let people have fun with them. Don't do it at the same time as everyone's trying to grind. Because the people that don't like grinding weren't going to grind no matter what you did. The people that don't like challenge quests weren't going to do the challenge quests no matter what you did. But combining the two just means that less people do even less of them, respectively. So it's certainly one of those deals that like, yeah, this is what I talk about when I say it seems like sometimes the devs have amnesia. Sometimes they forget even their own statements, even the lessons they learned back in the original years of FGO. And I think with, you know, staff turnover, this happens, but I'm sorry, this comment is like unacceptable for them. He's admitted to it, gone against his word, and now admitted to it again. That's why I find this, this statement so stupid on his part. So at least it's them reversing course again, which is how they should do it, but... Holy crap. So then the interviewer asks if they'll adjust the difficulty of advanced quests. Mr. T says if an advanced quest requires a lost belt and onward, that they'll make sure that they're adjusted. So uh, he kind of implies that, you know, again, that the advanced quests for basic mats are all able to be cleared if you can clear part one, aka, you know, all the way through Solomon Temple of Time. But that they're kind of going to be adding more difficult advanced quests. So they're meant to be a review of basic mechanics for the players for those part one ones. And he mentions that they've heard us on CQs having mechanics that are too difficult to comprehend. Now, I'm sure if you're someone that's a uh, challenge quest enthusiast, you probably don't think that's the case. But I've talked about this numerous times that at the end of the day, if somebody writes a guide for the CQ and that guide is like a functional like college thesis for, for its length of the mechanics... It's too much. Like, you don't need that convoluted of a mechanic to make a challenge. So it's kind of like, instead of making something hard, they make it gimmicky. And I'm okay with gimmicks, but the gimmicks need to be fairly straightforward. This is actually one of my big complaints playing on JP because I can't read on JP. So a lot of the times, whenever I encounter that, I'm just like, holy shit, uh, I don't want to have to think about that. This is why a lot of people go and do the Invincible comp. Just in general, they do not want to have to think about how to deal with every single mechanic. They just basically go in and check. 
does the comp have buff removal, buff block, AoE attacks? If it if the fight doesn't have those things, they probably just roll in with uh, invincible comp and just laugh at it. And I think there's a reason for that. It's because these CQs are getting a little bit ridiculous with the sheer amount of like effects that are going on in them. So yeah, I, I definitely think that's something. And I do think that a lot of people have complained about that to them, especially in these surveys. Uh, especially luck-based sequences needed to be stopped. So uh, for those of you guys that have ever done uh, advanced quests, do understand there are a couple of advanced quests that are pure bullshit. Like you can do everything right and fail the advanced quest due to pure bad RNG. And I'm not talking like, oh, your attack didn't hit. I'm talking like the gimmick just screwed you that attempt. You wasted your time and your AP. You were never going to complete it unless you just got absolutely lucky. That's the issue with those. So uh, a lot of people did complain about those, I suspect, and uh, they, they're going to stop them. So uh, Mentions again that balancing CQs with box farming and lottos is necessary and doesn't take too long. So he's not saying that they need CQs in lottos, that that's necessary. He's saying that balancing the CQs to make sure that they don't take up too much time during a lotto is what's necessary. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm not going to say you can't have CQs during a lotto, but I am going to say that like 31, that's not even a sane number. <laughs> like for anyone, for anything, right? Like if you were going to do that, 31 CQs with the amount of time that the devs spent even to implement that, that should have been its own event. It really should have been. So to me, uh, I'd say the maximum they really should reasonably have is seven CQs in a lotto. And I still think even that might be too much depending on the length of the CQs. If your CQ ends up taking you an hour to complete, that's a little too long. And sorry, we're kind of using uh, challenge quest and or uh, exhibition quest interchangeably here. Uh, Mr. Two wants CQs on a daily thing. Unclear what he means by this, as there are many interpretations is what my notes were. I did talk to Trubbs about this. He kind of says that uh, it was at this point that he was kind of talking with the interviewer and saying that like, uh, that they would both like some sort of daily CQ thing, which I've seen a lot of people in the community ask for. And I'm not going to say I'm against that. I just hope that if they put something like that in, that it is not rewarding. And the reason I'm going to say that is because I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to have to do a CQ every single day. I think that will really burn people out on the game. I think that will really get people to quit. So I'm going to hope that whatever the reward is, is it is either something insignificant or, again, it's just like a nice fun thing that's repeatable. Okay. Um, otherwise, yeah, I could absolutely see people just losing their mind over something like that. Uh, this would also, if they were to do this and they were to make the rewards actually substantial chat, this would go against one of their core stated design philosophies that they have mentioned several times in several articles. That is, play as you have the chance. That is one of FGO's design philosophies. Obviously, it doesn't hold true during a lotto right now. But uh, outside of the lottos, which I would say are the key clear upset, uh, exception to these things and, you know, raid events as well, uh, I think... You could really say that FGO is pretty lenient as to how it allows you to play, doubly so since Blue Apples are in the game. So I, I think it is uh, something that if they started trying to force you to do more stuff every single day, that their their discussion about like not wanting to overburden players and stuff would just be completely hollow at that point. Because that is just adding way more time and uh, involvement into a daily thing. And while I understand people would love it, to some degree, I also think the vast majority of like casual players would probably hate it. So I hope instead that uh, that if they ever do something like that, that it is implemented well. I'm not going to say they can't do it, just that they think about long and hard how to how to structure it. So they wanted to bring back past challenge quests as content. Uh, this is really funny for those of you guys that are doing uh, the Nero Fest CQs right now. You know they've already done that. Uh, for those of you guys that played the Tesla Fest challenges, you know they've already done that. And for those of you guys that played, uh, again, the Road to Seven Super Recollection Quest, you know they've already done that. So I'm really surprised that uh, they're saying this, but, you know, they also had the anniversary memorials that came out right there at Annie 8 that were past 
DQs. So instead of being the, the usual story memorial fights, they were actually just all old CQs. Um, interesting to say the least that they keep doing this, but uh, definitely nice. Uh, the map UI and free quests are able to be hidden. They talk a lot about this. I didn't really feel the point to elaborate on it. It's just like them being like, ooh, ah, yeah, I'm so nice that you can hide that now. Uh, this is mostly for like, if you wanted to take a picture or see like just the actual map of like a singularity that you can see it now. But I think it's only like, I don't even think it's part one that you can do this for. I think it's like only like the more recent singularities and stuff that you can, but uh, still an interesting thing. Uh, the interviewer at this point asked Mr. Two if he had the power to do anything, what would he implement? I really like this question. And Mr. Two gives a fantastic 10 out of 10 answer, chat. He talks about automatic sequences that could compress or fix his problems. He re oh, sorry, I, I skipped a line here. Uh, he replies he wants a craft essence adjustment functionality. And that in regard to that automatic sequences that can compress and fix his problems. So he's basically talking about auto ML being and cleaning up your CEs. That is exactly something I have asked for before. That would go hand in hand with something like an FP rollout fix, right? That uh, the managing of your CEs is one of the most cumbersome things in the entire game. That is smart. I am super glad that he is uh, that he's on that. Okay, because he says he's apparently already told the team about this, and then he laughed. So this sounds like they are working on it based off of that. Um, I'm super happy, right? Like having the ability to just like be like, hey, I have five of this craft essence, MLB it, or hey, I have all these junk craft essences that I'm not going to use. Throw that in a in a CE bomb. That's that's huge. Okay, having a, a QOL that can do something like that, that would that would absolutely save people a ton of time in this game. So uh, the interviewer brings up the auto team functionality based off of that. So for those of you guys that were unaware, the most recent power event gave them the ability to actually like you could basically like two tap load up a team. Uh, it was an interesting feature. It was really nice. It absolutely was rudimentary and problematic though. So like I started out using the tower by doing it. After about floor 50, I stopped using it and just loaded out my own team comps because it wasn't malleable enough to, to really shape it to what I wanted to do with the comps. Um, and one of the biggest issues is that it would replace your craft essences. Like, like you couldn't tell it like, hey, I want the bond craft essences. You would have to go put them in every single time. So it was just legitimately not worth. Um, Mr. Two says that it was meant mostly for tower events and for new players to be able to like, again, tower events, obviously, but new players kind of be able to like load up a team really fast. He also brings up the ability to make buster farming teams with Koyan Skaya from having taken a support Koyan, but it's not their priority. So chat, I want to be clear here. He's literally talking about the double Koyan Skaya meta. And like having the capability to just like press a button and load up a double coin sky at team. I want you to hold on to that kernel for a little bit later because I got a point to make on that. So they want to lessen the burden of constant party setups on players. I'm going to tell you guys right now, if they actually wanted this, they would have changed the way that they handled party setup. Okay. Because I don't know about you guys, but have you ever, you know, gone and done like the same free quest that you've been doing? Well, not only does it remember which which node you were on if you try to go back to it, but it also remembers what team comp you used last, and it just lets you go in and do it. That's perfectly fine. That's how it should always work. But whenever you're doing certain story fights, whenever you're doing certain event fights, it blanks your support entirely. Why? That's the only thing you shouldn't do. You shouldn't blank the support entirely. Even if it's like forcing two of the like event supports or something like that, just load it over the top and kick out the units that were there. I don't care, right? That way I only have to like change around two things instead of having to change around the entire party. So I think they have the wrong idea as to how to solve this, but that is probably a software issue is what they're dealing with as to why that's the case. Why it blanks your party every single time. 
Okay, but I do agree. This is a problem. There is a constant uh, setup burden, basically. So they want to be able to pick units that are useful to the node at hand. Um, it's kind of doing that, but for those of you guys that didn't notice, like, let's say that the node had Lancers, uh, Riders, and Berserkers, um, but it was actually, like, dominantly Riders. The auto team function would only, like, load out your team based off the very first class. And this happened numerous times in the tower where like the high health enemy at the end of the run was the other class. And it constantly loaded you out, like say here, it would load you out with sabers and then you actually needed assassins. And you're like, oh shit. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I, I know, that's why I stopped using it at about the, the 50 floor mark because I noticed that trend and I was just like, oh, this is going to get me in trouble. I'm not doing this. I want to be able to take like, you know, one of each class so that I know it's covered. Or again, take a berserker or something like that. Um, they're prioritizing it to make sure it fills a party to its max cost. That is also the issue is like it would, it would constantly max your cost and thus like you would get some really weird uh, unit options. You would get some really weird CE choices. So like it would, it would fill you out with six units and two craft essences. And you'd be like, That's not optimized at all. Thank you. Like, because it would be all five-star units, Chad. You, you would just be sitting there being like, okay, cool, thanks. Um, sorry, hold on. I lost my spot. Yeah, it yeah, uh, says the functionality is basic at the moment. I think this one, I think this is really, really obvious to any of us that, you know, use the feature. It is absolutely rudimentary. And... In that regard, I am optimistic that it can be improved and can be a truly good feature down the line. Like, I think it's an awesome thing if they flesh it out more. If they drop it and leave it as is, it's trash. No one will use it. Um, claims it's version 1.0 and will be updated as time goes on. So there you go. Uh, they want it to be an auto roster type of thing that fits the current event criteria. Sounds good. So well, let's see how they fix it. Let's see how they change it. Uh, the interviewer brings up servants changing their NP animation with overcharge. So this is in particular reference to Bima. For those of you guys that are unaware, Bima is the game's first unit that his NP animation itself will actually be different based off him having a higher overcharge rank. Um, Cool thing. I have no issue with it. I'm I'm a okay with it. But so he, you know, the interviewer brought it up. Mr. Two mentions that type wound type. Sorry, not type wound. Uh, type moon wanted rare NP animations. Uh, and they were talking like you know in general. So like for instance, whenever you guys do say Arish Kagal's NP, and sometimes you have King Asan or uh, Summer Nito in the background, that's what they mean by like a rare animation so it's like you have this alternate version where it's like oh this could also show up or again like super ryan where he's getting choked out by artemis that would be another one right so uh mr two wants or mr two mentioned that type moon wanted that uh their current plan though for the overcharge thing was only for bima because the interviewer asked like and basically made the statement of like oh you must have several units that do this and he's like no, we we only were planning on this for Bima. But then he does like conjecture and says that uh, Overcharge feels like a good way to do rare animations and that uh, you could be able to like secure the rare spawn if you had a higher rank of Overcharge. So he, he was basically saying like, yeah, hey, that's a good idea. I like that idea. Let, let's do that, right? Um, and then they moved on for Evocation Festival and says that for Evocation Festival, they wanted new masters to have an easier time catching up, especially in light of LB7. I think that's a good thing, right? Like I'm A-OK -okay with that. And this is a little bit eye-opening. Originally, they planned for uh, some of LB7's fight to have a 48-hour timer for completion after, uh, before reset. So for, um, not, not to go into this too much, but I haven't heard anyone talk about this one. This is severely concerning for me about the devs. If the prior comment right here is a good thing that the devs are thinking about that. This is, holy shit, someone on the dev team needs to be fired. 
They scrapped the idea when they realized everyone has lives outside of FGO. Nasu is the one who argued for it to be removed. So the non-game dev, the writer said, hey, don't put a 48-hour limit and then it resets on your stupid gauntlet fights. That's a terrible idea. And the devs argued with him on this. And Nasu won. <laughs> so, I don't know about you guys. That does not make me feel good that they were trying to do some shit like that. Um, I'm just going to say this about LB7. LB7 is going to be another one of those major roadblocks for people's accounts. That, like, if people don't have their, their account up to snuff, they haven't leveled a lot of their units, not making it through it. If you have not tended to your account well... Sit down, do it now. You guys have time on an A. You literally have over a year. It's it's basically a year and a half away at this point. But yeah, that is that is straight up concerning that they were going to put something like that on it. And especially because this is coming from the same devs that complain that people don't complete story in great enough quantities. Well, hey, maybe not putting a, a 48 hour limit and then it resets on you might be a good idea. Right? If maybe if you do that, less people will complete the, the story that like you want them to. That is the stupidest thing I've ever seen them say. So it like it might have been nice for a challenge perspective there, but like, no. Um, the interviewer asks about getting the stories attached to the welfares in the evocation festival. My man! Inter interviewer got our back, chat. So Basically, he's saying, yo, hey, where's the actual event story for the unit? And for those of you guys who aren't aware, they've made comments in the past, like uh, the whole reason they gave us that Dante's Tower event in the Rare Prism Shop was because they felt it was integral to being able to understand the character. And yet we don't have the actual stories for each attached welfare. You cannot go back and do them. They're just gone. So this is the interviewer bringing it up. Mr. Two states that while this was originally the plan, the engineering department is behind. So they only went with releasing the servant. I will give the devs credit here. If that is truly the case, releasing the servant, like, like rather than just giving us nothing, they chose to at least give us the servant ahead of time. So good on them, right? Like that is the proper choice. I'm happy they did it. Otherwise, wow. Wow, that would have been uh, that would have been really nasty at this point. We would have still been uh, waiting for for welfares after all these years. So the interviewer makes a point about the stories being critical to enjoying the units, and Mister Two agrees. This is hilarious because this, this is like the interviewer regurgitating the dev zone prior comments and using it against them. Um, but yeah, Mister Two is in agreement. He understands that concept and he wants it to happen. So uh, Kano, aka again Mister Two here, uh, says that they prefer new experience though compared to rerunning events. So this is seemingly kind of corroborating that that yeah, their engineering department, their software guys, they are super behind. They are super crunched. They don't have enough time to actually spend making a rerun. They're doing everything they can just to be able to produce new content right now. Uh, and he specifically says the dev's formation, and that is the word he uses, is barely standing in its current structure. They need more time. This is why you're not getting the welfare stories right now. So, not a good sign. <laughs> Just say. Um... The interviewer asks about Bond CEs from here and Bond progression bringing up their comments from last year's interview. For those of you guys that are unaware, Mr. Two brought up, well, I really, the I think the interviewer brought up Bond CEs last year and Mr. Two commented that like, hey, yeah, in the future, we, we need to do something about that. And he just basically said, you know, wink, wink, everybody needs to bond their units. And Mr. Two says it's a topic of the future, but again, encourages everyone to collect their Bond CEs. Only this time, chat, he doesn't stop there. Interviewer states how few Bond CEs are actually useful and get second archived. God, I love this interviewer at times. Uh, Mr. Two responds with, you shouldn't worry. They're going to make places where Bond CEs will be useful. 
definitely intriguing. He can only say that they'll be useful in the future, so please collect as many as you can. Interviewer points out the balance gap that would happen between players who have bond CEs and people who don't. Damn, it's like the interviewer is a better dev than, than the devs are. Um, and he's right, right? He responds by saying that you won't have a rough time if you don't have them. So, chat, remember my comment about class score and how they there's just no way they could actually design a fight around you having done your class score in the short term? Kind of exactly that right here. There's just, there's no way, right? Like, so uh, he, Mr. Two is actually saying that like, yeah, if you don't have bond C's, you're not going to have a rough time doing whatever the mechanic is that, that you know, you could have it there. Uh, he says that they're making it just so that things will work more smoothly if you do have the bond C. So it's kind of going to be the same deal. Fights will be easier if you have your bond C. Fights will be easier if you've done your class score, but it's not going to be impossible to do in spite of that. Uh, Solomon's bond mechanic is brought up by the interviewer. Mr. Two says it will play a significant role in battle tactics. He's talking about the bond C here. Uh, so try to collect as many as you can. This is why the bleached earth quests give so much bond. Now, the only problem I have with this is they made the bleached earth quest 90 plus plus, and it really does not feel like you can just use whatever comp you want to to complete them. Like, they made them so kind of up there that you really do need to be taking robust units against it. So... I could see this if they had tended to the back end of their roster a lot better over the past couple of years, but Dad, I'm I'm not taking I'm not taking Jekyll and Hyde into a 90 plus plus. I'm sorry. Like it, he's just gonna get slaughtered. So at the end of the day, they really do need to do something about that. Uh he punts on a question about there being more ways to gain bond, saying it will be discussed after this, the bond C change, I assume. Um so again, the, the interviewer basically asks like, hey, is there going to be, you know, more ways to gain bond in the future? And then he kind of also brings up the fact that, well, now starting members gain 20% bond now. Now, I wanted to bring this up myself because we talked about this on Discord the other day. Um, I don't feel like getting more bond is a bad thing. However, this change is stupid. It does not really work. You're going to see their reasoning here. Their reasoning will make sense. I just fundamentally disagree with it from a design standpoint. And the reason I'm going to disagree with it is because I think their reasoning is belying their true reason. So the interviewer also brings up uh, that it's an interesting design choice and says that depending on the servant, it'd be difficult to put them on the front row. Interviewer knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, Mr. Two agrees. Said, though, that they made sure the back of the team wasn't implemented. He states that this forces you to make completely different rosters rather than just doing the same old thing. Hey, chat. Remember that earlier comment that he made about wanting, you know, like a new player to be able to form a double coin Skya team with their new class feature? Yeah, this is him contradicting himself again. <laughs> So he's well aware of metacomps and wants players to be able to form them easier, but at the same time doesn't want you to do them. <laughs> it doesn't work. I agree. So he, he basically says that and does that. And then uh, the interviewer asks if there will be additional changes to units uh, that have bond 15 or greater. And I'll, I'll get onto that in a second. But so again, the reason I have issue with this is this is the real reason right here. He doesn't want you doing the same thing. He wants you to not use the same units. He wants you to roll for more units. He wants you to have a more diverse roster. And, you know, I think on, the, on, on premise, we can say that that's not necessarily a bad thing. But when it's coming from a dev saying this, especially when the devs have gotten a little bit more money grubbing over the years. Yeah, no, this is just straight up. They want more money. That's, that's all this is. I even talked to Trebs about this. He kind of agrees. This is, this is their way of saying, yeah, we, we want you to roll more units. We don't want you to keep using the same stuff. So, not a good thing, in my opinion. I, like I said, I'm okay with getting more bond, but I would have rather either had it on the back line or for everyone. Or And here's the better idea that I've come up with that the devs can't seem to figure out. How about 
when a unit hits bond 15, you get overflow bond. That is, the bond that would have gone to that unit gets distributed to the rest of the party instead. That way you can keep using units that are your favorite. You can keep enjoying the game. You don't have to feel like you're wasting bond. But that would be a smart change. They won't do that. That won't earn them money. So, it is what it is. So again, the interviewer asked if there'll be additional changes to units that have bond 15 or greater. So this is the interviewer also kind of hinting at, will there be a bond 20? Mr. Two says that there'll be no additional changes to bond 15. Not gonna lie, kind of sucks. Like, I, I do think bond 15 should have a reward attached to it. The fact that it has nothing other than the generic 30 courts is like, meh. They're not pushing for... They're not for pushing just your favorite servant, but rather bond for all. Again, I think it's okay to say like, hey, bond all of your units, but yeah, this one's gonna come across really bad with the player base, okay? Like, they don't want you to use your favorite servant infinitely. Hate to break it to the devs, they're favorites for a reason. That is predominantly what players will enjoy is using their favorite servants and you're telling them not to use them. That's not a good thing. That is a terrible decision and message to your team. So I do not like that at all. You'll see something new in the future for bonding. This is left vague and ambiguous. So again, hopefully whatever that new thing in the future is, is good. Because right now I am absolutely not liking what they're doing and kind of what they're saying. Their terminology on this is terrible. They need to pull their head out of their ass. I can't take Melt to everything I don't want to play. Yeah, and that's, I think you're going to see a lot of people, a lot of people will just mentally check out of the game if they can't, if they feel like they can't use their favorite units or that they're being discouraged from doing so. So then Grail fronts get talked about. The interviewer asks about the evolution of the concept, aka how is it changing over the years? Because for those of you guys that are unaware, uh, Grail fronts got brought up last year. Uh, so, Grillfronts got brought up two years ago. That's when Mr. Two talked about PvP. Everybody lost their collective minds, such that last year's interview never mentioned PvP. They totally left it out. They dropped it like a bad habit. They knew it was a non-starter for them. But in the process, they still talked about Grailfronts, and Mr. Two back then said... Well, yeah, okay, I know we haven't run one in like a year, but you have another one coming up. And that'll be, that'll be the next one that we have. Since then, chat, we only had that one. They haven't done another one ever since. So they're, they're like, they're barely even managing to do one grail front a year right now. And I don't know about you guys. I know some people don't really like the grail fronts. I actually do. I thought they were pretty cool. Uh, they're very like, you know, chill and relaxed. I, I kind of enjoy doing them, but I'm also someone that's a little bit more strategic minded. So I don't mind trying to like navigate through there and like, you know, do some of the solos and stuff like that. But it is, it is an interesting thing to see that they have not utilized the system. Despite their own words being that they are spending so much time developing that system. So, uh, again, uh, Mr. Chu says that they're planning to show them very soon. It's big enough that they've brought on a guest writer for it. And actually, it needs to be not them. It's the next one. He specifically means that, uh, yeah, hey, there, there is a, a, another Grail front coming. And it's big enough that they brought in a guest writer for it, which does corroborate with what they've said previously on this, that, uh, that they, the, for the next Grail front, they wanted it to be a story-oriented one and they wanted it to be big. So uh, you guys kind of saw that with Moonsault Operation for any of you that played it. It was, an, it was a better Grail front, but my, my complaint about it was that that Grail front, you know, got on the realm of like really annoying CQ for how long it took, right? Like I, I had no difficulty actually completing it so much as just getting through the Grail fronts each day would take like over 50 minutes. So they definitely needed to, uh, to slow that down some. Or not slow it, speed it up. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, uh, Mr. Two then gets a question on the ninth year implementation and ideas as to what that would be. Uh, I thought that was rather interesting. And he basically says that FGO will make 10th year no problem, but he started to think about what will happen when they get there. And that for ninth year, it's technically their 10th year of playing the game. Because remember, first year anniversary, they had already played for an entire year before that. So technically, this is actually year 10 of the game that we're on. He brings up their goal of hitting 30 million downloads and says that they're striving to make it even better than the 20 million downloads campaign. And I remember uh, Trubs talking about that, that like they he was basically going all in on that, saying like, yeah, I can't wait for 30 million downloads. It's going to be great. You guys, you guys, I can't wait for you to see it type of stuff, right? So they're, they're going to make it better than even the 20 million downloads campaign and how great that was. So hopefully it's something crazy and good, right? Uh, he did say, I think, by the way, chat, that we're at 28 million. So not too much longer to go to hit that. Um, said that they'll improve the Bleach Earth stuff and Bond CEs in the meantime. So that's really all he gave us on the upcoming year. Like, he basically kind of just said like, yeah, hey, 30 million downloads come, it's going to be better. And we're going to improve uh, Bleach Earth stuff and Bond Seas. Last year, we got told that they were going to improve quick, which was a very nice, like, thing to tell everyone. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was really, they didn't even fulfill that one. So hopefully this is a promise that they'll actually deliver on at that point. Uh, Nightbot's not working. I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, so uh, I did point this out that there was no mention of coin fixes or Bond 20. Uh, they don't explicitly mention Bond 20, but they do pretty much say by virtue of that question about Bond 15 that like, yeah, you're not getting an increase or a change, right? Like, so it is what it is. We'll just have to wait and see. Like, maybe they'll give it down the line. But as of right now, that is not on their docket to do. I'm glad they're cooking. They need more staff. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll say this, right? Like, there are some really good things that Mr. Two points out here where you just feel like Mr. Two gets it. And then for probably the first time ever, there are several mentions where I'm just like, I don't know anymore. I, I don't know if the devs actually understand the player base. Like, there there's some things that are really concerning in that regard. So hopefully they do a little bit better there. But... Like I said, that was the Mr. Two interview. Now, the shorter one, which is the interview with uh, Nasu and Takeuchi. It's actually the longer one, but I'm not going to spoil you, so you're not going to get to see the majority of it. Um, there will be at least one LB7 mechanic mention in here, so if you don't want it, this would be the time to check out, but again, we will talk about it. Uh, but don't feel like it's really a spoiler chat. So, especially if you've paid any attention to, like, JP's marketing and stuff like that, you're not going to get spoiled. Um, so, right off the bat, the interviewer asks uh, about Arcuid coming to FGO and why. Uh, Nasu basically mentions that uh, after Suki R, a.k.a. Sukihime Remake, uh, Nasu wanted to pull her out as fast as possible. Uh, at the moment, however, she's not involved in the main story, so it's not easy to involve her yet. It's actually really interesting because I saw a lot of people on Twitter trying to say that, uh, you know, oh, well, she's not going to be involved in story. That is not what Nasu said. He said that, okay? That essentially she is not currently involved in the main story. Not that she wouldn't be. So that's why, again, I think some people just run in quickly and Google Translate it and take it out of context and they don't quite get it as to what was actually being said there. Uh, Takeuchi says the fan expectations were there too, so he talked to Nasu about collaborating, aka, you know, getting Arcuid in the game. Uh, Nasu wanted to bring her in in a different form, hence Archetype Earth. So he didn't want to just bring in Arcuid, he wanted to change it specifically for FGO. Uh, Nasu says that it's not worth a full-blown collab with Tsukihime R yet, since it's not fully released. For those of you guys that don't know, only the first part of Tsukihime Remake is out. We do not have The Far Side of the Moon, which is several other stories. So they still have to do a little bit more in order to, uh, to totally wrap things up on that. Um, 
And as a result, that's why they're saying like, hey, we're not going to do a full-blown Tsukihime collab in FGO. Yet. 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 So just keep that in the back of your head there, chat. Um, they're half excited and nervous. Uh, they were half excited and nervous about announcing her. He talked about how like they were really unsure until she... Like, like, until they actually made the announcement that he saw the fans' response and he was like, oh, okay, they like it. <laughs> Which is funny to me because I'm just like, I'm surprised he would think anyone would dislike it. Well, you know, I say that, never mind, I forgot Tsukihime fans exist and they're always angry at FGO, so it is what it is. Um, not all Tsukihime fans, by the way, just, just the really annoying ones. Um... They were half excited and nervous about announcing her. Sorry, yeah, there we go. I already covered that. Uh, the question about the bleached earth. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate for potential spoilers. It, this was really weird and out of left field. Uh, and so, like, Nasu started getting into some story explanations here. NA doesn't have this yet, so I'm not talking with you guys about it. Uh, the interviewer says that they're excited for the other heroine. Uh, this is implied to be basically someone else from Tsukihime. I'll let you figure out who that is. Uh, Nasu basically says that it makes sense for Heroin B to show up, but uh, to not expect it for now. Uh, claims that future Nasu will take care of it. <laughs> My man literally said, this is a problem for future Nasu, not current Nasu. Ain't doing this. Um... Archetype Earth's first ascension was apparently the most difficult. Takuchi says it was their goal to bring Princess Ark to life. Uh, Nasu's favorite ascension is the second, reportedly. Um, and then he says that the third ascension is an FGO-specific what-if form of Arcuid who never sucked blood and was trapped in her castle for thousands of years. So there's that. So they're each kind of slightly different. Uh, the interviewer says he's excited for a Tsukihime version of Carnival Phantasm. This is weird. This is very muddied. He talks about Phantasm Moon, and he's basically just alluding to Carnival Phantasm and says that he wants more Carnival Phantasm, right? He's basically saying he wants, like, the Tsukihime X FGO collaboration with Carnival Phantasm to happen again. And Nasu says that it would be great, but if they do that, then people would call into question a true collaboration with FGO. So he's saying we're not giving you more Carnival Phantasm because then you would doubt whether or not we would actually do Tsukihime collaborating with FGO. He's, God, he's basically confirming it's going to collab, okay? I, and the thing to understand here, too, is when he says collab, he is not necessarily meaning like, a, like, like your annual collab event that you get. He is meaning collaborating in the, in the general sense of like, yes, like, at some point, Suki Hime will enter FGO. Like, we have no idea who, when, where, why, how, but it will happen. You will get more than just Arcuid, is kind of what he's saying. Uh, he says there are many things that FGO has to do first, however, before that could happen. Says that once that's all done and over, then perhaps a Carnival Moon could happen again. There you go. That's that's his way of saying, look, you're going to have actual Tsukihime stuff, but uh, only until all of that's done, only until we've done the collab, then we can do more Carnival Phantasm. And chat, I skipped like three pages of this interview that were spoilers, okay? I did, I did do my due diligence. I did tab through it, and I tried to get anything that I thought was relevant for you, but... Uh, Trust me when I say it's very difficult to pull out when the man is just talking story units and story characters and stuff like that. Like, so they talk a whole lot about LB7, a whole lot. So uh, the interviewer then asks a question about Grand Servants. Nasu states that divine spirits becoming a Grand are almost impossible, but there are exceptions. And he had prior stated that they couldn't. So he had stated that divine servants couldn't become it. And in here, he just says that it's almost impossible, but there are exceptions. So, Gat, you know the deal with Grands at this point. Just don't overthink it, right? Grands are whatever Nasu wants them to be at this point. So, uh, The interviewer asks about Olga Marie and plans to release her. Like I said, chat, if you paid attention to any of the LB7 
advertising. It was pretty much impossible to avoid, but like, yeah, none of this should be a spoiler for you. Uh, Nasu states that LB7 grew so big topically that they had to split it into two parts. This was sort of a, like, he dodges the question at first and just starts talking about LB7 and how big it got. Um, and then he talks about the desire to let fans know how cute she was when they showed her design back in LB5. So if you guys remember, she's basically uh, uh, President Earth, right? Like, back in LB5 when she shows up. So that's one of those deals where they just did not, like, actually want to you know, overplay it, but they still wanted you to understand, hey, she's cute. She's still Olga, right? Um, Nasu says that Olga Marie is not planned to be brought into the game as a servant. Please note the transcriber's notes. Don't believe his lies, chat. Then he has an anecdote about them needing to get permission from the system team for the implementation of AoE attacks that no other servant has. And you're going to have a note here that for any of you that have played LB6, you know that at a couple points in LB6, MASH has an AoE attack in her attacks. So... Kind of pointing that out. I'm building a case here against Nasu, and you'll see I get proven right in the end, chat. You will see. Just hold on to your horses real quick here. Uh, the interviewer asks if there was anything meaning to Olga being on the cover of the new soundtrack album. So for those of you guys that haven't seen, Olga is the cover of, of our like next part of the soundtrack that they release. Um... Nasu talks about how the art is, like, really nice. It's, it's like, there's a lot of, like, globes and stars and everything in there. But uh, he basically says that there was no hidden meaning. The art is just beautiful. It's meant to, like, show her in that room, and that's it. Now, whether or not you believe her, that's up to you. But I, I probably believe he's actually right on that. Like, this is, this is probably the interviewer overthinking it, right? Um, and then I skipped a lot of LB7 spoilers again. So the interviewer switches to talking about Ordeal Call Socio. Uh, Nasu says that Socio will have a very similar theme to 1.5, aka Epic of Remnant chat. Uh, but they wanted to give the writers more creative liberties. Nasu has asked the writers to give the, him their best product going forward with Ordeal Call. And this is interesting because he heavily implies that Ordeal Call is being written by other people. So I do find that at least peculiar. Takeuchi mentions that La Single has recently increased staff in order to solve the issue of having enough people to handle character design. So, there you go. They have increased staff. Now, I think this is the issue that we've kind of pointed out all along, though. It's good to hear that they've hired more people. I love to hear that. But, yes, this sounds like this is artists, not coders, animators, programmers, right? Like this, it sounds like the bottlenecks are still unaddressed. So I, I'm happy to hear they've hired more people, but it still sounds like they have a lot of hiring to do. But have they maintained staff? Yeah, that's the other thing. We never hear about whether or not people quit. Um, Nasu says he always wanted to implement a five-star Medusa, but Takeuchi's character design load made it difficult. He's implying that Takeuchi is just inundated and overbooked constantly, and I totally believe that based off some of the other comments I heard. Uh, there is an anecdote, and I'm not going to tell you when, where, where, how, uh, about, like, they were talking about a character, and that because Nasu changed things, there were, like, I think like 12 different iterations of the character, if I remember correctly. And that like Takeuchi had to design them all. And I'm like, holy shit, Nasu is even sandbagging his co-partner. Like he is literally causing Takeuchi to just waste time and effort when he shouldn't. So yeah, it, it, there there's some really like weird notes here that kind of indicate that Takeuchi himself is swamped at this point and it's getting kind of ridiculous. But I also wonder if that means that Takuchi's handling a little bit too much of, like, the core design and less is being left up to the individual artists uh, 
compared to what I thought, right? Like I always assumed that the individual artists just kind of got some narrative points and were given a concept and say, draw some and submit it to us. But it sounds like maybe Takeuchi is doing a little bit more than that, or maybe him networking and dealing with all those artists is time consuming in and of itself, which is certainly possible, especially if he has to ask for revisions or something like that. Yeah, also doing uh, Tsukihime Remake too, which like I said, it sounds to me like Nasu's potentially done writing Tsukihime Remake, but that doesn't mean that the game's done and released yet because they still have to implement it all, right? So yeah, I could easily see as Takeuchi's being swamped still on that end of things. Uh, said that, uh, and again, remember this is about Five Star Medusa. So they said that they had intended her to be a four star, but that the artist design was so good they made it a five star instead. Good job, artist. Chad, I want you to go find the artist for Five Star Medusa. Go at them on Twitter and thank them. They are the reason you got a Five Star Medusa. Otherwise, Nasu was going to sandbag you into getting another four star. Everybody like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, interviewer comments that he wants to see swimsuit Medusa. That interviewer is a bro. Um, Nasu perks up and says, oh? Oh? Takeuchi says they'll keep it on their back burner for now. Um, I, I think it's like, that's Takeuchi's way of saying like, yeah, it's a good idea, but uh, it's not happening this summer, right? Um, because they, you know, at, as of giving this interview, they probably had already like decided what they were doing for this summer. But yeah, uh, great, great job interviewer there. Uh, so Show 2 is currently in the works. That's part two of Ordeal Call. Uh, but Nasu asked for you to be patient. So, again, it's stated that, like, they don't really have a time estimate for you, but it is coming. Uh, he specifically clarifies that Sosho 2 is in Tokyo, but not Shinjuku. The interviewer asked, like, hey, I know it's in Tokyo, but is it going to be in Shinjuku? And, and Nasu's like, no, it's not Shinjuku. But it does have to happen in Tokyo for a reason. He says it's going to be crazy, and that he's counting on the people of Lasingle to to bring it to life. So it's like... Oh, God. I am, like, I hate hearing Nasu say that it's going to be crazy. Because I feel like this man does not understand his own limitations. Like, <coughs> it just feels like it's going to be, like, just, it's either going to be way too big and long, or it's going to be, like, some, you know, just out there concept that, like, no one's going to be able to grasp. Nasu talks about how there's a lot of classes who don't normally get to join a Grail War. He's talking about extra classes. Um, before, so he's, it, it, with regards to this, he's saying that, uh, and I probably need to word this better, but he's saying that essentially that's what Ordeal Call is about. It's the story of these extra classes, which again, you guys should kind of know from the advertising for it without spoiling it but that it's kind of about the extra classes you don't normally get to join in the Grail War. So you have the seven main classes in a Grail War that can normally join, but hey, here's some extra classes that don't get to. And he says a lot of interesting stuff here. This is why I really put it in. So before FGO ends, though, you'll find out about their existence and why they continue to be existing uh, will be talked about. Dosho is about telling the story of those classes. Moon Cancer, however, will not be one of the stories told here. Nasu talks about it, how it's an exception and is illegal. He, he basically goes into the lore dump about like, no, 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 this isn't supposed to be a thing. BB did it, yada, yada, yada. Like, like Moon Cancer is not supposed to exist. Um, says that Pretender is an exception too, as the character is just putting up a facade. So... Essentially, they're not going to cover Pretender story because it's literally just, hey, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. That, that's the background of Pretender. Mentions that Shielder is another exception as well, as there's no reason for them to write a story for just one character. Well, I put down here, chat, this seemingly confirms MASH is the only Shielder. You're not getting another. And that is, that has been my feeling for a long time, right? Like... But that they're saying like, hey, yeah, we're not going to write a story just for MASH. Now, I would like to take this out, set this right here on a pedestal, the statement by Nasu, and declare it a lie. Because all of FGO is MASH's story. All of it. 
they have written a story for one character. It's not really for one character, right? It's also for the protagonist. It's also for uh, all of Chaldea. It's also for all the servants. So, but it is interesting that like, yeah, MASH, basically all of FGO is her story. Uh, the interviewer then brings up the Beast class and Lilum Harlet. <laughs> Takuchi says that he was surprised to see a Beast class would be coming. He, he basically talks about how, like, he, he gets into work one day and that, like, all of a sudden he sees on his desk Beast class and he's just like, yeah, it's surprising. I didn't expect to see that. So something tells me it's like Nasu just was suddenly like, yeah, it's time. We're doing it. <laughs> uh, Nasu mentions that it was time for at least one Beast character to show up. Uh, the class card for Beast is specifically aimed at Draco's usage. And that it's supposed to be Draco exclusive. But he does mention that Kiara has gotten harsh treatment and chuckles. So, I would also like to point out that I've seen people on Twitter say that Draco is going to be the only Beast servant. That is not what this says says that Draco is supposed to be the only beast servant that we're going to get. But you're not. You're going to get more is kind of what this is implying. Um, interviewer asks if we can expect more beasts. Nasu says most likely not. Please, chat, uh, do, do pay attention to the highlighted portion on your screen as the transcriber has uh, left a valuable note for your understanding. Draco is a beast that is proper human history based and can exist in proper human history. Takeuchi asks Nasu if it was okay to say that. Nasu claims he hasn't told a lie and that he specifically included a key word that makes the statement okay. Like I said, chat, Nasu just confirmed everything I have talked about with him in these interviews for years. Nasu straight up lies to you. You know he lies, right? He, this is him actually saying, yeah, I lie, but I said it in such a way that it's still half true. It's still technically correct. And therefore, you can't get on to me. I haven't lied to you. We, we've always known this. That's always how he is. He always will phrase it in such a way that it's like, what he's saying is not incorrect. But it's not, you know, totally correct either. He, he does it in such a way to allow him an out. Because he knows what the out is. He always does. Um... And like I said, that's just one of many instances where he's done something like that. Like that. Uh, the interviewer then asked about the cover image being Summer Castoria and Morgan. And Nasu says that he went all out for Summer this year. Well, chat, are you ready? Because uh, Nasu went all out for Summer this year. Uh, Takeuchi comments that Morgan would have naturally been wearing a dark colored swimsuit. We got robbed. Uh, but this would have conflicted with the event then. Uh, that needs to be changed. That is a typo. Um, basically then says that uh, they put her in white and gold instead. So it is an interesting thing that like, yes, even Takeuchi says she should have gotten a dark colored swimsuit because she's edgy. But yeah, we changed it. So that like that is one of my issues with Ace as a servant at this point is that like that is a really weird lore concept for a servant for any of you that have read it and like I question their their design direction with that but still uh, some of it will be dresses as well he's just kind of talking about the first and the second ascensions there chat um, Nasu claims that Morgan was a smooth process but Artoria Caster was a rough one. Takeuchi agrees. They wanted her to have unique features as a swimsuit character, so they made multiple and immense amounts of drafts for her. So it sounds to me like they wanted to make sure that they had something that fit, and so they tried a whole lot of different things. The final concept is that they added street clothing with a sailor uniform style design. 
this is like they're talking about still that first ascension that we've had revealed it's kind of there it doesn't really strike you as a sailor suit but like if you look closely you can kind of see like yes that is what they were going for so yeah that, that concept may be a little odd to you but yes they did add street uh clothing to it uh they wanted it to be impressionable but keep the importance of castoria second and third ascensions will have details you will like Question about the timeline of Musashi's character then from the interviewer. Uh, Nasu says that Samurai Remnant Musashi is between Shimosa and LB1. Her calling herself Iori in Summer 4 was a pretense to get by. It was not, she was not actually Iori or anything like that. She was just straight up making up a name. Um, in 2019, they started talking about the concept of Musashi having a disciple called Iori then though. Takeuchi states that the protagonist Iori in Samurai Remnant is an amazing person and that his dead fish eyes are good. I'm not even kidding you. He does say this. Like, I think he, I, I think he specifically says like that they're amazing or something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, but it, it's, it's his way of just saying that he really likes that like, you know, unfazed look, right? He encourages you to enjoy Samurai Remnant when it comes. Interviewer asks about the desires for ninth year moving forward. Dakuchi says that LB7 was a tough battle and that their maximum budget costs keep going up because they keep trying new things. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I'm all for them trying new things, but like, maybe save some of that budget for like, hiring people! Just fucking hire people! Holy hell! <laughs> um... But it is what it is. Uh, they, they clearly need to up the amount that they're paying their employees so they don't lose them as often, yada, yada, yada. They need to reclaim their, uh, their reputation as a company. Uh, but again, th because they keep trying new things. This year's swimsuit event will show this. So they do specifically say there is a new mechanic coming with this summer. They don't tell you what. They don't tell you why, they don't tell you how, they just say there's something new here. Um, says they're doing their best and asks for your continued support. Nasu thanks LaSingle for making his dreams come true. Says there's more exciting sequences to come and asks everybody to enjoy it together with them. Now, did you notice that Nasu doesn't really mention the end of the story? In fact, Mr. Two did. Nasu doesn't really. He does kind of mention the, the story's conclusion at earlier points, but uh, not right here at the end. So something tells me they've gotten to Nasu, they've threatened him, um, and they've, they've, they've held him at gunpoint at this point, and they've just said, like, look, you, you need to stop, like, saying the game is going to end. It's not doing good things for the game. So uh, I, I think talking about the story's conclusion is one thing versus talking about the end of FGO, as he had been putting it, was really toxic and negative, and he needed to not say that. So he, his tone is certainly a lot lighter here in this interview, and that is at least, uh, you know, heartening, basically, that, that we, you know, are not going to get uh, sort of doom and gloom Nasu this year. I think at this point, every time we don't get doom and gloom Nasu is a good thing. But again... That was both interviews. I will put the link in the description to the video and you guys will be able to find it here. I will also put it on Discord after stream so that people have access to it. But yes, uh, I, like I said, there are certainly some concerning things here. There are certainly some things that I am really happy to hear, but uh, ultimately it's a very mixed bag as far as both interviews go. And I'll be curious to hear your thoughts about it.